¡Empezamos! Bienvenidos a otro episodio más de Empodérate de Chicanos por la Causa, un espacio que hemos creado este, para poder compartir nuestras historias, para compartir cuáles son nuestros challenges, what have been the uh, lessons learned and what we can unlearn, uh, how do we share uh, so many similarities with everyday leaders in our community. And sharing the space with me is here today. Once again, Fatima. Fatima, muy buenas tardes. How are you? How do you like it? You're a pro now. This is your second episode. <laughs> getting more used to it. That's right. We're getting yes. there. Yes. And so um, this next guest, Fatima, I've been asking her for a while now, <laughs> probably almost a year. Um, and so now she's she's made some time to be here with us. Andrea Martinez, who worked with two previous governors who could be anywhere, but has been spent, what, the last 20 years at CPLC now? 20 years, Andrea? 20 years, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for coming here today. It's my pleasure. Anything mm -hmm. for you, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for saying no to her all those other times. I, so I, said yes to <laughs> I can be here <laughs> during this episode. The universe works in amazing <laughs> ways. ways. It lines up. Yes, you're right. It lines up. Um, so I, in my office for over a year, I think, um, I have a very special edition of the largest newspaper <laughs> in the state. <laughs> And I just want everybody that is not able to see right now on your screen. It's um, Andrea's beautiful portrait. And the headline says, those who identify as Black and Latino make up a growing share of the U.S. Hispanic population. Andrea, I just love how candid you are and you were in this story and, and what a difference it has made. Um, I know you've heard from people, mm -hmm. um, I've heard as well, in sharing this story. Tell us about your family and, and, and what is, it means for you to share that history and what we can learn from it. Mm, uh, well, thank you for, for, for sharing that. It was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it was different for me. I, I don't know that I anticipated to be on the front page above the fold. Apparently, that's a big deal. People told me that. So it's I a know. huge deal, yes. Um, the first time CPLC with anyone ever made it, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> What I love about that photo, though, that's on the, on the front page of the newspaper is in the back of me is a mural of a tree. And during the COVID years, some of our staff from Surprise in Elmira, Arizona, wanted to come and beautify our little campus because um, it's called Plaza de las Rosas, mm -hmm. and there are no roses there at all. <laughs> and so we have trees, <laughs> two trees, <laughs> and one might have died. And so they came and did murals, and um, that was one of my favorite murals that they did was this tree that represented all of us better. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one of my favorite pictures that their work is um, represented on there. Um, you know, being Afro-Latina, mm -hmm. I'm black. I mm -hmm. present as black. I'm Mexican. Uh, my family identifies as Mexican, Mexican-American. Um, I have a very, very large family here in the valley of, of, of Maricopa County um, in, in Arizona. And... Um, I'm one of very few black family members. Mm -hmm. Our last reunion, which was in November of last year, was for over a thousand people here in the valley. Family members. Wow. <laughs> very few of us are black. And so even within um, Latino communities and neighborhoods and families, there still exists a black and brown divide. Um, and it's what I've lived. It's what I've lived before I was even born. Um, and so that's what I was sharing um, in, in that article is my journey with my family, my journey in the church, my journey in life, um, being Afro-Latina, being different, being... Um, Um, unique, unique, being rejected, being rejected, being disowned before I was even born. My mother and I were disowned because 
she was having a black child. <clears throat> and I, my mom ended up marrying um, someone who was Mexican who adopted me. And so I grew up in this Mexican environment. And then she moved us out um, a little bit further east to try to get us into a better school because edu- she knew that education was important. We had lots of... Um, our family was large, but we had lots of um, poison in our tree, mm. and lots of cycles to be broken. Mm-hmm. And one of the cycles was poverty. And one of the things that my mom saw that could be different for her children was education. Um, and so that came across to me very early. And I, that was my way out, was education. And so I used that to educate myself about my cultures, mm-hmm. um, about society and how it worked and what is shared and what is not shared, what is accessible, what is not accessible. Um, And education was my way to break cycles, to change the trajectory of our family forever. Um, And so it was um, a tough journey that I struggled with for a long time until I learned to love myself. Mm. And once I learned to love my uniqueness, right. um, being black, being Mexican, being left-handed, um, being gay, being different. I felt just different every day in, in, in every way, from my family to my profession to church. Um, rejection was woven through all of that. And it wasn't until I flipped it and began to look at all those differences as my strengths. Exactly. Yeah, that made yeah. a difference for me. So what did your mom have to say about you sharing your story and being public about it and, and sharing it with so much pride? That's a good question because I was concerned about that. But you know what happened is within my program, I run Early Childhood Development uh, for Chicanos por la Causa. Um, and I used to do keynote speeches for my, mm-hmm. my staff every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had shared a lot of my story throughout those speeches. And I invited my, my mom and my dad to the mm. one that I was going to talk to about them. Good. So they wanted them to hear it from me and I wanted them to know how I was telling the story. And so they had heard me talk about it before, but I still, I, you know, my, my mom's father is still alive. My tata, um, lots of the poisonous branches of our tree <laughs> are still living. And um, I, I often have to make decisions about what am I going to affirm and mm. what am I not going to affirm and how am I going to do that? And how am I going to do it in a way that builds bridges and moves us away from the poison and towards breaking cycles and not creating chaos and drama and hurting people? So she was, she was okay. She was familiar with how I told, told the story already. That's great. That's, that's fantastic. And um, so um, your journey has been, uh, I mean, you've, you've worked for two um, former governors um, and you could have been anywhere, um, but yet you've been um, educating um, for what, almost 20 years, yeah, yeah. right? Um, our largest program. So now you oversee and, and support 800 leaders, um, close to 800 mm-hmm. in um, four states. Four. four states. So how, how was that journey at, as a leader? How, how do you unfold that and being able to connect and, and support so many of our kids? Every time you talk about Head Start, center and the program and your team, it just inspires me so much. So please share. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I love them. I love them. Uh, I I do take an enormous amount of time and effort to visit every single site Mm -hmm. and get to meet every staff member that I can um, and do it multiple times. Relationships are so key. Relationships are key for our littlest ones in their foundation, the mm-hmm. first five years of their life, if when they have caring relationships and adults around them, whether it's their family or um, in childcare, um, that creates a foundation for how their brain develops for the next stages of their of their childhood and for the rest of them the, their journey as an adult. It's the same for adults. Relationships mm-hmm. are key and connections mm-hmm. are key. And so I spend a lot of time and effort to sometimes to my own detriment, 
um, getting to know my sites and staff and states and communities because I, they're our face. They're the face mm -hmm. of Chicanos por la Causa in, in Texas, in New Mexico, in Colorado, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And in all of the communities there. And most of them are rural communities. Mm -hmm. Most of them are not urban, big, sprawling urban communities like Phoenix. Phoenix is what, the fifth largest city in the United States. Mm -hmm. Most of our communities are not that. And most of our staff are from those communities. And so for me, me connecting with them where they live and work uh, speaks, I think, volumes. And it, it's what works for me. And I, I trust my leaders. Um, I assess and make sure that people are in the best position that suits their strengths. And uh, I trust them. I don't need them to be perfect. I don't need them to be me. I need them to do them the best that they can. And we're all going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I make mistakes all mm -hmm. the time. And so mm -hmm. as long as we can talk about them and learn from them, then that's how we evolve and grow. And that's really my foundation. My foundation really is love, connection, and relationships. And and you also have like this special tone when um, you send out uh, that message to them, and and so it's their full self mm -hmm. that you want your staff to be able to connect with you to mm -hmm. understand that mistakes are bound to happen, but we need to learn from it and then move on from it. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what do you do to stay grounded, speaking of what gives you so much peace to be able to share with others and wisdom? Well, you know, peace is happens sometimes <laughs> 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 because I am human, um, but it is really important to be rooted. I find um, this year, 2024, I decided was going to be the year. There's a lot of shift and change in my life, mm -hmm. professionally, personally, um, on every level. And I decided that I needed to really think about how I took care of my mind, how I took care of my body, mm -hmm. and how I took care of my soul, my spirit, mm -hmm. my mental health, my physical health, and my spiritual health. And I really thought about what does that mean? We say that all the time and we have New Year's resolutions, but what does right. that mean? And I was really intentional about what that meant. And so I am reflective of that all the time, um, every day. I am trying to be thoughtful of what I put into my body, what I eat. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to take care of my heart in terms of exercising and physical activity, which then takes care of my whole body. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to me to take care of my soul and my spirit um, and how I share my love. And so um, I make time to be active. If it means getting up at four in the morning to go walk the dog or to go on a hike with my hiking buddy, um, I make time for it. Uh, I make time to move. I make time to incorporate those things that I wanted to prioritize for myself. So being rooted in that is, um, has been helpful to me important yeah absolutely we we're talking about um, um fatima who is the newest member of uh, our team and now co-host of our podcast is the um how you two were uh, connected at this event without knowing what each of them because there's nearly eight thousand of um of the cplc familia but um there was something that you know you you approach um, Andrea and 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 then and then you you mm -hmm. had to talk about that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, a conversation that we were having right before um, we started rolling the cameras, and it, it was actually the first conversation that I had with Andrea that um, planted a seed of inspiration in me, and that conversation was about this um, intersection that she was at between choosing two different positions and you know her way of like how she went about it with choosing and I feel like it's a really interesting story if you wouldn't mind sharing it yeah so I um when I was deciding on the two positions Washington DC um or the building that was burning at Chicano School <laughs> that, that my friend referred me to um I I said ma um my dad was in the hospital at the time, and I said, Mama, um, you know, they want me to go w work at CPLC, at Chicanos por la Causa, and they want me to run this agency that they, they just brought on. And she said, Ay, mija. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm like, what is that? <laughs> Where's the joy? There's a battle for me, mom. And she said, ay, mijita. Um, she said, Chicanos por la Causa is the good old Latino boy network. And mija, they're not ready for you. They're not ready to hear you. They're not ready for your voice. And I said, well, mom, I don't know. Domingo's there. I want to work for Domingo. Andres is there. Um, I'll be there. I'll go do it for a year, maybe three. 20 years later. Three, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 20 years later, here I am. Um, so um, I fell in love with the work that we do closest to the earth. Um, and I stayed through some really crazy times. Um, I stayed because I believe, absolutely believe in the transformation that and the opportunity that our programs provide for the littlest ones mm -hmm. and their families. And we work with their whole family. Yeah. And so we get to see these um, babies come back as adults and their teachers and police officers and firefighters wow. and doctors and accountants and bankers and running foundations and professional teams. Um, and they remember their Head Start teacher, they remember their family right. service worker, and they want to come back and they want to give back. And so our programs transform families forever, um, forever generations is what I usually say. And um, I, I fell in love with what we do and I fell in love with the people who do it. And so I stayed. And this is, this is my purpose. This is my igikai. It's um, what I live for and what I learned that I'm really good at in terms of macro systems and creating leaders, developing leaders, um, even over four states. Holy right cow. now, right? Yeah. See what Gosh. I told you? Every time you hear her talking about her program, is just like, I want to I wanna do this. Uh, right I now. love it so much. <laughs> I really, it's, it's genuine it's, love. It's I genuinely amazing. love them and what we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I can see that. So mm -hmm. we we're talking also about um, the historical moment that we're undergoing here at CPLC. And... Um, I remember Alicia said that one of her first texts was from you telling me about what you said and, and what transpired. My first text. <laughs> <laughs> You're making history. That's what you said. Oh, my gosh. And um, so she, in 54 years, we have our first soon-to-be uh, president and CEO and, and right now interim president and CEO, the first woman in 54 years. <laughs> Yeah, um, she is it. She's the one. Um, I believe that actually a while ago um, should change occur that I, my vision um, was that it would be her. Um, and it's, it's a pivotal moment. It's transformative. We are evolving. We are at a time and place um, to shift the conversation forever. Um, and she's the one. She's, she's the one. She is making history. And I'm very proud of her. She is capable. She, is, um, she has weathered every single storm that has come through CPLC mm -hmm. um, for all the time that she's been here. And we've been through some tough times, um, financially tough times. So she has been a part of all of them. She's been a part of all of the deals. She's been a part of all of the stealing from Peter to pay Paul situations <laughs> that we've had when we couldn't make payroll mm -hmm. um, to us being so strong um, and well-respected now. She's had a role in all of that all of that and now she is the face and the lead and I'm hoping that that is solidified soon um shifting gear, gears for a little bit uh, we were talking earlier about you know um, a different topic but when Fatima reached out and you said yes to her <laughs> um you talk about some and, and then and then I also follow you and then you share really um uh, uh, some insights in, in in your videos but um I'd like for you to expand a little bit on rejection you you mentioned mm -hmm. you know um rejection and, and and whether you've experienced it personally or professionally and and how do we how do we deal with that how do how do, how do you 
you know, come from that and 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 flourish. It's hard. Rejection is 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 hurtful. It's tricky. Um, you know, I've I've experienced rejection most of my life in many ways for many reasons. Um, and I think I think that um, if we can look at how it can strengthen us, mm-hmm. I think that that help might help one move through it. I'm really one that comes from I I don't compartmentalize well. Some people do. You know, I deal with it all, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I really allow myself. And I've learned that I needed to do this. I allow myself to sit in it, whatever that feeling is. If it's joy and and glee, if it's um, rejection and whatever I'm feeling from that, or if it's anger or depression, I allow myself to sit in it so that I can move through it. Not to stay there, but to move through it. And so I allow myself to be fragile. I allow myself to have mm-hmm. emotions. I allow myself to... Um, be in a place where others can protect me and support me and where I can be vulnerable in a new way so that I can move through it. And then after it, afterwards, I reflect and think, okay, all right, so what did I learn from all that? That hurt. <laughs> and it was very painful. But what do I take from it? What can I learn? What can I, what can I do different? Or what did I learn about the other person? Or what did I learn about my job? Or what did I learn about that leader? Um, and those are the lessons that I take. And so rejection is is difficult and rejection can be detrimental. Mm-hmm. It can, it can take lives. Um, and at the same time, we can find a way to use it as a tool to make us stronger, which women do all the time, mm. women of color specifically. Yeah, you're right. So after rejection, there should be reflection and then action. Yes. You it's helpful. To- it does. You cannot, we're not always able to do it in that way. Uh-huh. Um, but if you can find a rhythm, um, and make it a habit, it becomes easier right. to move through it. So um, prior to CPLC, um, so most of your career has been spent on uh, supporting uh, family and child-driven um, services. Mm-hmm. Um, let's step, take a step back. Um, tell us about that experience and, and, and working through after, after college and 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 your experiences in an other field outside of out nonprofit. Of, outside of CPLC? Outside of nonprofit. <laughs> Is there life outside of CPLC? I don't even remember. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, when I, 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 was, I wanted to go to a university really bad, and I was eager to get through my education and get out and make money and change my family, really. And uh, we ran into to challenges, and I, I had to go to a community college. Um, and I was really, really angry and upset about it, and I had to figure out how to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to work full-time, go to school full-time, and figure out how, how to make it all happen. And I remember thinking, well, I want to go in business. I want to go make money. I need to, mm-hmm. you know— create all this opportunity for my family. And so I kind of like, like college students, you just don't really know what you want, but you kind of might think. And so I changed my major a few times, but that wasn't helping me finish fast. And so, um, and I needed to transfer over to, eight, to the university. And I remember I had a math class and that was, there were a couple of black professors at the community college. Um, and there was one math class that I took and it was, taught by um, an African-American female, and she was really hard, really hard. Um, And I was actually really good in math, and I did really well in her class, but I was really shy. And and so on one of my um, tests or homeworks, I don't remember which one it was, she wrote a note and said, see me after class. And I thought, oh, "Oh my God, she thinks I'm cheating. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) What? Why does she want to talk to me? <laughs> what did I do? I don't even talk in class. I'm like the first one in my seat. So I was stressed out. So after class, I sat in my in my chair and well, she waved me to me for me to come up because she figured out who I was. Um, and I said, Did I do something wrong? And she smiled and laughed 
in the most endearing way Mm -hmm. and said, I just wanted to see who this student was that was excelling in my class and doing this incredible work. She said, I wanted to meet you. And so that affirmation gave me, was everything to me, was everything to me. So I said, well, I'm going to go be a math major. Maybe I can end up at NASA. I can go into Mm -hmm. engineering. I can teach math if I wanted. So I like it and I'm good at it. And she said I'm good at it. (laughs) And so I went to go see the first advisor I could see. It was an older white man. And I said, I'm going to be a math major. So let's lay it out. And I want to transfer to ASU and da, 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 da. And um, he looked at me and said, didn't even look at my paperwork. He said, um, you're not good enough in math to be a math major, so I wouldn't suggest that route. Let's look at for something else for you. Oh, my God. And almost in the same breath, almost in the same day, I went from feeling not validated and um, supported to stuffed down and um, minimized. And so I didn't become a math major. He quenched that for me. Um, I did figure out what what I wanted to do. And Mm -hmm. and so um, so originally I was in banking and business and um, I ended up um, falling in love with sociology. Another Mm -hmm. African-American woman was teaching lots of sociology classes and I fell in love with the idea of communities and um, systems and how it works. And I was able to see myself in all the things that happened in the community that I struggled with. And then I was able to take an eagle eye view and look at some of the factors that affect it and try to understand how it works and how do you influence that? That was always my question. How do I influence that? Mm. So I'm in it and this is what I'm experiencing, but who's making the decisions? Mm. Who's at the table? Where does the power come from? How do you shift it? How do you get to the table? What if the door is closed? Um, you know, how do you get in? Um, and so I fell in love with that part of it and that led me to um, working in nonprofits, um, in behavioral health services. I met Veronica Peña. I worked for a woman named Veronica Peña for mm. a few years, and uh, she, she changed my life. Um, we always say that she was, she's, she, I'm the daughter that she never, she, she never birthed, but we're, <laughs> but we're connected in that way, and she was the best person at my wedding, and I love her so much, and she's really, um, She changes how I think about the world and she challenges me and I like to be challenged. It's dangerous when everyone around you thinks the same as you. Your your algorithms and your social media are very dangerous because it affirms what you already know and think. There's no challenging dialogue. Mm -hmm. There's no um, being able to disagree and uh, agree to disagree. I mean, that was the beauty of getting together and having food and drinks uh, um, at people's homes and, and bantering about things and disagreeing. We don't do that anymore. We look for affirmation. The same, the same. So, so. So um, she challenges me in that way, and, and I appreciate that. So I started in a different way, uh, thinking about business, ended up um, falling in love with systems um, and um, working with children and families for 30 years, wow. over 30 years. I think that basically summarizes how rejection is rede- redirection. Because Absolutely. you, you yes. received that affirmation that got you... Your, your emotions so high, being like, oh, I'm going to become a NASA rocket scientist. Like, I'm so good at math to then going to your counselor and then be like, you're not good enough. Then rejecting you. Mm-hmm. But because of that rejection, you were like, OK, well, maybe I'll try sociology. And you could have been a NASA or science rocket mm-hmm. scientist, but um, you probably wouldn't have done the impact you've done today. Right. Yeah, exactly. Which is a lot greater. I mean, because we can send... Yeah, any rockets, rockets but the to, impact to the you moon. have with your eight <laughs> over almost eight hundred liters, mm-hmm. like that is like, who else would have done it? Yeah, besides I you? appreciate that, and I love how you phrased that. Um, I might have to ask you to use that in the future. Yeah. So, but I will credit you. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so universe works in interesting ways, and um, sometimes we want to control the outcomes. Mm-hmm. And we don't always have control. And sometimes you have to just let it be and flow like water, not just be laissez-faire and not take anything into consideration. But um, when you when you flow like water, you end up where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. So. There's that saying that's like, 
um, tell the universe or God or whatever you believe in your plan and they'll look at you and they'll laugh at you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, exactly. Because <laughs> they're like, um, it's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. That's exactly it, yeah. Um, so we were talking about leadership also earlier. Um, I wonder, um, and, and I never ask you this question, I, I wonder how do you see different... How, uh, how does, would, or does it gender play a role in, in, in leadership and how you are as a leader or what you see that maybe you don't? And like, are women and, and men um, different leaders? Hmm. Because you've had the two. Yeah, right? I have. And I, I love both of them for different reasons. Um, and I appreciate my experience with both of them. I, I needed both of them, mm-hmm. actually. And yeah. um, I love, in, in, in ch- the childcare industry and early childhood education, it's very woman-focused. Mm-hmm. My um, workforce is probably 93% female. And so when we get a male teacher, oh, I jump for joy because I think it's so important. I think male and female energy is very important. I think that as a society, I don't know that we do a great job socializing from early on. And I don't know that it's maybe the best approach that we use, but it's what happens. Um, And it does create different types of leaders because of how we socialize Mm. boys and how we socialize girls. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. I was recently talking to uh, a good friend of mine, actually, from the community college. She was my advisor, and she was talking about her um, relationship with her son and some challenges. And at the time, I had two other friends who were talking about their challenges with their sons and, and adult sons. And I said, you know, why is that? And I don't have children. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I have 2,000 children yeah, in my you program. Yeah, have but... many over the years, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I said, I asked, I asked her, why, why is it that we struggle um, with sons? And it's, it's right now, it's, it's just popular right now. And she said, this was her answer. She said, um, we approach boys differently. And especially in families of color, Latino mm. families specifically, yes. they are revered. And so from the moment they are born, and my brother, this too, my brother is the king and queen and prince and princess of no our wrong. family. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's just, you just have to accept it. That's what it is, you know. Yes. Um, yep. We revere them in a different way. And so they grow up being revered. And so that's what's expected. Women don't. Women of color don't typically grow up in that environment. And so we're usually the doers. We're usually the fixers. We're usually the caretakers. We're usually, we do all of those other things and play all of those other roles um, and go work (laughs) and birth children uh, and and (laughs) iron clothes or or, or whatever, whatever we're doing. Um, And so it creates different styles. It creates different environments and it creates different approaches, but not... But we need them both. Yeah. We need them both. I think both leaders are integral in where we need to go. And, and for you also, you mentioned right after college, I mean, or during, while you were going to college, um, Papo um, Domingo had an, an, an impactful, I mean, uh, role in your life at the time. Certainly made you want to consider coming back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so how is his leadership style? What was it that resonated with you at, you know, at that time when you were trying to figure out this is what I'm going to do or I need to go in a different path? You know, he, um, he showed us um, that he was a real person. He mm. talked about his history. He talked about his challenges. He talked about his journey. Um, he welcomed me into his home. I was a part of his family. Mm. Um, I um, was so much a part of his family. Is when he died, um, myself and another person arranged all of his services, everything, everything. We did everything. Um, and he showed the humanness of a leader. And, mm. and he understood the power of women leaders at a time when 
my mom was like, ay, mijita. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and he, he represented a different way of thinking. He was well-read. I loved that he was well-read. Whatever he said, if he quoted a book or an author, you know, as soon as I left, and we didn't have internet like we have now on our phones back then. You had a, There was maybe dial-up somewhere, and it took forever to get on. And so your research, you had to go to the library. And so mm. whatever he mentioned, <laughs> I either went to go check out the book from the library, or I found a place to buy it, and I read it, and I read it again. I read everything he mentioned, and that made a difference to me. You were observing everything mm-hmm. that, yeah, the human Yes, mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. of his leadership. That's that's really awesome. And another thing that Fatima may not know about you. You don't know <laughs> We talk a lot but about I, it. We chat. I do. Okay. <laughs> you love music. I do love music. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is a part of my rootedness, actually. Yes. Yeah. How do you how do you do that? Like, how did music became such a big role? And what's your favorite music? Oh, my goodness. Maria Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like choosing a favorite child. <laughs> um, music is a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, but, but art, creativity and art is a big part of my life as well. Um, I, I love um, museums and art. I love, I actually write essays and poems. And um, I play instruments, just not like very well, but I have a drum set. Um, music is, is I have integral. A, a guitar, we can make a band. There you go. I love it. <laughs> I don't know how to play. What, what you going to play? Um, <laughs> do you sing? We need to sing. Do you sing? <laughs> See? The flute? We're going to figure it out. We're going to yeah, figure, we'll it figure it out. Figure it out. No, I don't know how to play any instruments. But... <laughs> the clave. With auto-tune? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, music is a part of everything I do. Everything I do. Live. I love live music. I love... Um, I have music all the time at work, at home, um, different types, different types of music. Um, what was your first concert? Oh, my goodness. Gosh, I've been going to concerts since I was probably a, an early, a tween. Uh, really? And you know what's funny is that I saved all of my ticket stubs so I could probably tell really? you but I have oh, like, okay, but I'm also going through a change in life right now and I just am getting all of my stuff back so I'm not really sure where where that file is but um I don't remember my first concert what were we into then um what kind of music is it probably um uh probably r and I, I I was a a, a hip hop an east coast hip hop Band. Oh, there was a difference. There's a, there's West a very big difference. The East Coast, very, very, very big really difference. at yes. it in the 90s. Yeah. You no, know, probably don't remember Fatima, but Veronica, who's here <laughs> in the studio. I wasn't even a thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, barely you even a fetus. Hip hop wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but also. East Coast. But you were living in the West. Yes. Maria has Is that judgment? Perdón. Is that judgment? <laughs> connection you had to the east because well, aside from the music because usually there's an emotional connection because it, it was more artistic it was poetic it was about oh, social justice right. there was a whole bunch of different yeah, stuff right. happening in new york um that was that's then right. and it started before the west coast actually and so i was attracted to the cerebral part of it and mm. the rhythms and the melodies they were just different they were different um but at the same time i grew up hearing Cumbias, rancheras, mariachi. I actually remember wanting to, I played the violin when I was younger and I wanted to play. My, my cousin played in a mariachi and, and at that time there were very few women, and, it, unless you sang. You weren't a music, You didn't play an instrument, and I didn't sing. So I wanted to play the violin and the mariachi, and that just wasn't in the cards. It wasn't going to happen for me. I got no, 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 and I wasn't that good anyway. But that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> in my head, in your head, you I was. were you were perfect for it. Yes, it's the same way with me and, and ballet folkloricos. That too. I remember I was going to school, and at the time in elementary school. They, they chose whoever was going to participate in a particular, you know, um, performance. And I always went, and I was never chosen. <gasps> oh. I was always the last one. And I was like, 
but I'm just as good as right. Right. <laughs> That's what I thought. Of course, of course. You know what? So, I, I remember with um, with Bala fol- Folklorico for me is that <laughs> my hair wouldn't do what others did. And so I felt like I didn't belong there. You think so? That's how but, I felt at the time. But usually they, they were more like really tight. It so just, it's not it, like. It wasn't. It wasn't the so? same. I it, love your for hair. For me, it was. Now that's different. I love my hair too. But <laughs> <laughs> at the time as a child, I all I saw were the differences and why I wasn't like everybody else. Yeah. It wasn't my voice. I, no. always had, I, always, I always had confidence in my bad voice, but I sing in the shower. I mean, you listen to enough music, I think, to sing very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask those who love me. <laughs> They will be honest. But it's fun. Yeah. So what fills up your tank? Like when you're really feeling down, mm-hmm. what, what is it that, you know, fills up your cup? What is it that you do? Um, sunrises and sunsets oh, fill my tank. Um, you'll see that probably often a lot, uh, often on my social media, just because it never gets old to me <laughs> ever. Uh, the sunrise and sunset, um, music, live music specifically, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Sunsets and sunrise. I'm like, it's a start. Sunrise is the start of a new day. You know, you have another opportunity you feel. Mm-hmm alive mm-hmm. you you can you know undo or redo mm-hmm. or unlearn and relearn is just um so much so much potential mm-hmm. that I you agree. see certainly at the very beginning and at the end it's like yes i made it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's very peaceful yeah a very peaceful feeling yeah i also um love to read and so um i love words word usage creative use of words and clever authors and challenging authors and that rejuvenates me in a different way so it takes me out of <coughs> um excuse me yeah oh well you're um talking about reading i remember about another conversation we had had where you were talking about because we chatting <laughs> Fatima. we be chatting we're old friends <laughs> about um You had done, uh, uploaded this video on your social media about one of my favorite books. And the author is Dominguez Ruiz. Ruiz? Don Miguel Ruiz. I mean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about like, um, is it the four, the four commandments? The Four Testaments? Close, yeah. Four, four Agreements. Com- four Agreements. Same idea. <laughs> Same I'm idea. blinking out. But. Same idea. The Four Agreements. Mm-hmm. Yes. They're so simple. Don Miguel Ruiz wrote... Um, Uh, this book about the four agreements, uh, Toltec Wisdom. Mm. And um, they're very simple, very simple agreements. That's what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. But they're so hard. But if you can live by them and remind yourself um, to live by them, it really can transform your days. It can transform your relationships. <clears throat> It's don't make assumptions. You know, I got to ask one or two more questions. Don't take things personally. Always um, be impeccable with be impeccable with your word. Mm. Do what you say. Say what you do, mm-hmm. and um, always do your best. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Simple, simple, simple. Yet so difficult. Hard. Yes. I don't think I got to ask you though. Which one's your favorite out of the four? Right. It it changes actually. It shifts mm-hmm. depending on what's going on in my life. And right now, what I'm really drawn to right now is. Um, is don't make assumptions. Mm-hmm. Um, because coming off of, I'm getting divorced right now, and I think part of why um, our relationship failed from my perspective and my experience is uh, because we didn't, because we made too many assumptions. We didn't ask the one or two or three additional questions to clarify, and what ends up happening is that you look at life through your lens. And so... Um, whatever is said, then you interpret it through your experience. And that's not necessarily what that person is saying. It's not what that person is sharing. And then you create the narrative that goes along mm. with it. And you can be way off. And we ended up being way off and ended up gr- growing in our divide rather than growing closer. And so for me, that was a very big lesson. And what assumptions did I make? 
And how many more questions could I have asked to understand better what she was going through or what she was saying? And the same for her, but I don't have any control over her. I only have control over myself and my own experience and what lessons I'm going to take. And so right now, that's my favorite right now. So, and I use it everywhere. I use it at work. I use it with my colleagues, with who I report to, with my leaders, with staff. I use it in my personal life with relationships and friends because um, I don't want to create the narrative for for you. I don't want to create it for you. I want you to tell me your narrative. And mm. I want to see life through your lens, not through mine or what I think it looks like. I want you to tell me, um, and I want to understand it through your vision and experience. And so that's what's guiding me right now. I love mm. it. It's so much empowering, though, because you're allowing the other person to really create their own narrative and to understand what picture you want. Exactly. Right, to yeah. be that you want to formulate together with and making sure that they have the same understanding. I wonder how do how do you embrace change? I know you've you talked also mm. about that mm-hmm. um on your on your videos. Yeah. So I wanted you to sh- share a little bit of it. Well, I always say uh, my my <coughs> Arizona I call my Arizona leaders uh Jedi, the Je- my Jedi Knights, and they have a Jedi council. <laughs> um that may or may not make me Yoda, but no. <laughs> We'll see. Oh no! <laughs> it's really adorable, though. <laughs> you can always... <laughs> um, and so they, they, one of my Jedi Knights here in Arizona um, remembers that I always say, "Shift happens. Shift happens. Shift." And I learned that from Veronica Pena. Mm-hmm. Um, shift happens always, and it's it's inevitable. Um, and most of the time, we don't like it. We're not prepared for it. We maybe tense up a little bit because we want things to be status quo and run how they have. But I've been do using this paper form for 20 years. Why do I have to change this paper form? Um, and so change is inevitable and shift is inevitable. But for me, in terms of work and, and even personally, too, it's how you communicate how you communicate what's coming or what's about to happen or what's just happened, how, um, how you allow conversation to happen about it. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes it's just going to happen. But you can have conversations about it. You can process it. And even if it's not today, it can be, you know, tomorrow or in a week. Um, be open. You can be open to uh, revisiting the conversation. And I'm re- open to revisiting the conversations when it comes to really anything, but specifically shift and change because it's hard. It's hard for people. Yeah, you're right. You just have to accept it and figure the best way to embrace it. Yeah, yeah. Andra has been such a long time coming. <laughs> I want to reiterate that. <laughs> and thank you, Fatima, for um, helping making it possible. <laughs> Fatima, you did great. Outset. You did great, Fatima. It was yes, my Fatima. Sent the invitation, though. <laughs> so it's, it's a pleasure. It's a joy. It's an honor to mm-hmm. be able to share the space with you every time Like I have the opportunity to be in your space. I'm better for it. Thank you, thank Andrea, you, for, for sharing and being so candid and open and taking the time because I know you're really busy. So thank you so much for coming today. I love it. I love it. Thank, thank you. you. I've, I've had fun. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's all for today here at Empoderate, our new season. Isn't it exciting? We'll be back next week.